Well, hey, let's, uh, let's go ahead and start by uh, entering into a time of prayer. Let's pray together. Uh, God, you are worthy. God, it's so amazing to me that we can step into this place and no matter what it is that we are going through, wherever we find ourselves, God, you are still worthy. And so God, I pray that as we enter into this space, as we open up your word, as we listen and be attentive to your spirit, God, that you would teach us, that you would guide us, that you would show us the way. We love you. We thank you so much for who it is that we have in Jesus and the hope that we have because of him. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, hey, happy Sunday. I know, uh, man, we're in Northeast Ohio, but I just got to love the Bengals representation that's happening on the stage today. We got lead worship pastors and guitar player. It's awesome. So uh, I don't know if you know this, but there's still football being played in Ohio. I don't know if you knew that, okay? So just by a team further south. Uh, but hey, my name is Brian and I'm from Cincinnati and I love the Bengals if you don't know. And I'm one of the pastors here at FCC and I'm super glad just to be able to hop in with you. We are in week two of our series called Start Here. Now last week, Jimmy crushed it. He talked about how important it is for us to find rhythms and set up uh, just these habitual things and, and times and intentional mo- uh, moments where we're spending time with Jesus. And over the next few weeks, that's what we're doing. We're unpacking five different traits, five different characteristics, five different rhythms and behaviors that we believe if you instilled them into your lives, they're going to cultivate growing faith and growing relationship with Jesus. And so last week, Jimmy talked about hang time with Jesus. And if you saw online, we put it out there. We have this uh, prayer and Bible reading plan that we made available. I've been doing it. Some of the people in my life group have been doing it together. We're talking about it. Um, And that's a resource that's free and available to you. If you don't know where to start and you don't know what it looks like to have regular hang time with Jesus, start there. You can go to hub.firstchristian.com and it's right there at the top of the page. It's an easy PDF, lays out some scripture, some things to pray through and guides you through that. So let me encourage you, go ahead and take advantage of that God. But as we dive in today to week two, let me, let me ask you a question. I want to start here. Have you ever been around a person that just makes other people around them better? Like, think about that for a moment. Like, there, there are people in this world that just have this unique ability to make the people around them better. I used to hate it. But Tom Brady was notorious for this. Maybe not now, like he's getting a little old, but like like Tom Brady like 10 years ago, it was like they would get nobodies on the Patriots. You didn't know who these guys were, but they were on the same team as Tom Brady. And when Tom Brady starts throwing him the ball, they like start catching it in the Hall of Fame. That's what happens when you went on a team with Tom Brady 10 years ago. But a lot of people said he had this unique ability to raise the efficiency and raise the talent and raise the bar for the people that were around him. And some of the best athletes have this trait. Maybe in your life, you have somebody who brings out the best in you. Maybe it's a friend. Uh, Maybe it's a coach, a teammate, a coworker, a classmate. I don't know who it is in your life. For me, it's always been my wife. She's like my greatest challenger. She sees potential. She helps me to strive to achieve and to do the things that I didn't even know that were in my wheelhouse. She's also my biggest encourager and my biggest champion. And she makes me better. I don't know if you've got that kind of person in your life, but as followers of Jesus... We are called and invited to do that for one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul gives us this warning. He says, bad company corrupts good behavior. Bad company corrupts good behavior. So if that's true, and it's in the Bible, and we believe that the whole Bible is true, if that is true, then can we deduce, or what, what, how do we answer this question then? Does, does good company inspire high character? Right? If bad company corrupts good behavior, then I think we can deduce that good company is going to inspire high character. Last week, Jimmy uh, shared that prolific youth pastor proverb, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And in that challenge, he told us, like, consider this, you've got Jesus as the main source of influence in your life. That's how it should be. But then the people that are also at your table have an influence on where you take your life as well. 
And so if we believe that negative people can have a negative influence on our lives, we better believe that good people, positive people can have a positive influence on our lives as well. And so here in week two, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the importance of community. I believe that God's greatest gifts to us are his grace through Jesus, his word as we see in scripture, and his church. And when we live in God's design for what he's created us to experience and live in, we are going to experience the best possible relationship with Jesus and also fellow believers. And within the community of the church, there's accountability. And specifically, we're going to talk about what it looks like to live with accountability in our lives today. Now, there's this misconception that accountability and the word in and of itself has a lot of negative connotations. Like when we hear that word, some of you might have already tensed up, be like, I don't want to be accountable. Like you want somebody poking and prodding and digging into my life and telling me what to do and what not to do. And that's the misconception. The misconception is that accountability is only there to catch you in your wrongdoings. That accountability only exists to catch you in the act of doing something that you shouldn't do, to catch you making mistakes. But that's not what accountability is. You see, true accountability, it's not existing to catch you doing wrong, but it exists in order to encourage you to do right and to help you grow. My wife recently started teaching um, online, which is a whole different world. She did classroom teaching for the longest time years ago, and she's got this new gig where she's teaching online, and she sits in our office on her computer and video teaches and gets piped into a brick-and-mortar school in Houston, Texas. And so there she is on a TV, I'm imagining, in a classroom in full glory teaching these kids in Houston, Texas, right? And so here she is, and she's doing all this, and she's kind of new at it. It's a new thing. And uh, she had a meeting with her supervisor just last week. And as they start the meeting, he sends her this document that's basically a manuscript of some of her conversations that she's had with students in the classroom. And she didn't even know that she was being observed. So her reaction when she was reading this document, it's like pages and pages. It's so detailed and so thorough. She goes, wow, I didn't even know anybody was watching me. And the guy goes, we're always watching. I was like, that's kind of creepy. Uh, No, but he said, we've had several people observe you at several different times and we're always popping in on classes and we're able to see how you're teaching and you don't even know that we are there. How would it be to live our lives in such a way that unbeknownst to us that we had people who had a clear view in to see how we lived, how we acted, how we led our families, how we pursued Jesus, to see the areas of our lives that we need to grow in, right? And and that coach, that supervisor is popping in on her classrooms unbeknownst to her so that he can garner information to help her be a more effective teacher, right? I think she's pretty perfect as it is. She doesn't need any help. But what would it be like if we had people who had a view, had a window in so that they could help us pursue godliness and righteousness as well? In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25, the author of Hebrews, he says this, he writes this, he says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. The author of Hebrews uses some very important words. He says, let us consider how to motivate one another. You see, there's like this mutual partnership that happens when we step into community-based accountability. There's like this mutual benefit that takes place. It's a two-way street. There's not one person presiding over the other. It's for a mutual benefit of both people engaged in this relationship. And so as you consider what it could look like to live in accountable relationships with other followers of Jesus, I want to give you a couple of characteristics, a couple of traits that have to exist in that relationship that are key for it to really be what God wants it and designs it to be. The first is this, transparency. Transparency. The first thing that must exist in a relationship where each, where two parties or more are being held accountable towards godliness, towards righteousness, is this characteristic of transparency. 
And to be transparent requires humility. It, it, it requires honesty. It requires coming into the conversation knowing, man, I've got mistakes. I've got flaws. I'm not perfect. I don't have it all figured out. But being willing to submit to those things and let other people see that level of transparency in your life. Jesus says this in John chapter eight, verse 12. He says, if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. And see what Jesus was saying, like when we live in darkness, there's things that we, we conceal. And when we conceal things and when we hide things and when we bury things, we are living in darkness. But the great thing about Jesus is Jesus brings things to light. And light exposes things. And have you ever noticed how uh, maybe you've been in a situation where you're like, man, I just, I'm kind of embarrassed by that. I don't know if I want people to know that. And so like we conceal and we bury and we hide and we cloak under the banner of darkness. But when we expose things and when light hits things, there's moments in that season where things start to bring birth to freedom. There's like this, this freedom aspect that comes along with getting out from the veil of darkness, with getting things out exposed by the light because there's just this relief. Yeah, it can be hard. Yeah, it can create pain. But the freedom that comes in knowing that everything is out, the freedom that comes in disclosing the things that we once were afraid of, there comes freedom with that. Light leads to life where darkness will ultimately lead to destruction. The next thing that this relationship, these interactions have to come with is permission. As people stepping into the, these relationships, we have to give permission to the people around us to ask hard questions, to dig into the things that they know we need to have conversations about. I have a few guys in my life and they have the permission to ask me any hard question at any given moment. I've given them that freedom. They know my temptations. They know the things that irk me. They know how I'm wired. They know the things that frustrate me and they have complete permission, whether it's relationship-based, whether it's work-based, whether it's my walk with Jesus-based, whatever it is, they can dive in and ask me any questions about my life in order to get at the things that are contributing to me either pursuing Jesus or being held back in my relationship with Jesus but we have to give each other permission. We have to give one another the right and the ability to speak into our lives in order to foster that accountable relationship. And the third thing is this. The third thing is courage. If we're gonna step into these conversations, if we're gonna step into these relationships, it's gonna take courage because guess what? Identifying things that we need to work through, that can be a scary thing to step into. To be willing to admit fault and then move towards a path to pursue godliness can be difficult. It takes courage to identify the things in our lives that need attention and then to focus on Jesus, to take steps of repentance. In Matthew chapter five, verses 29 through 30, Jesus says this. He says, if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your strong hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now, I don't think that Jesus was talking about taking a cleaver and chopping off limbs, okay? Like, I don't believe, I think what Jesus is getting at is he's saying, hey, as a follower of Jesus, your life, it literally means to be Christ-like. To be a Christian literally should mean to be Christ-like. Now, none of us are perfect and none of us will achieve perfection until we're in the fullness of the glory of God. But as we live this life, striving to be more and more like Jesus, he's challenging us to take inventory of the things in our lives. And if there are things that are getting in the way of pursuing Jesus, of being more and more like Jesus, I mean, we gotta eliminate those things from our lives. Those things might be relationships. 
It might be content on Netflix. It might be toxicity in your workplace. It might be the elimination of busyness and hurry. But God is saying, hey, if you wanna pursue me and live that full life in devotion to me and experience the joy and fulfillment that comes with walking with me, you've gotta take inventory of the things in your life and evaluate whether or not they are contributing to you pursuing Jesus. And if they are not, maybe it's time to cut those things out. And it takes courage to do that. I believe that as we live in accountability, accountability is gonna lead us to repentance. And and repentance is the turning away from sin. It's not just the acknowledgement of it, but it's the turning away from it and pursuing godliness. And then as as we live in repentance, repentance will lead to true forgiveness and true forgiveness will lead us to godliness. And that's the goal. The goal is for us to be more like Christ. The goal is to experience the fullness of Jesus in our lives. And so as you're considering, man, how do I grow in my faith? How do I grow in my relationship with Jesus? Last week, we spent so, all that time talking about hang time with Jesus. Now it's talking about, like, let's get in relationship with other humans who are going down the same path that I am pursuing, and that is Jesus. And so what does it look like to live in those relationships? I know like stepping into community and stepping into accountability relationships, man, that can be fear. You might be overwhelmed with the idea of that. But let me tell you, there's hope that comes, especially when you start bumping shoulders with other people who are pursuing Jesus and you realize, man, there's a lot of people who have the same fears that I do. So where are the best places for these relationships? Where do we step in to receive community and to be a part of having accountable encouragement and relationships that honor Jesus, that point people to Jesus? The first and foremost is this. We love life groups here at FCC. Specifically, we love this thing called Rooted. Over the years, we have had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people go through Rooted. And if you're tired of hearing us talk about Rooted, get over it. We're never going to stop talking about Rooted because we believe in it so much that as we're pursuing Jesus, as we're growing as followers of Jesus, as disciples of Jesus, that this is a great way, the most important way here at FCC to get into community that's gonna foster these kind of God-honoring relationships in your life. So what is Rooted? Well, first and foremost, Rooted is this 10-week journey that people engage in with one another as they're pursuing what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. There's weeks in there that you're just figuring out, man, what's your story? How do you articulate your faith and your belief? Why is it that you choose to follow Jesus? And how do we tell that to another person who's considering what it looks like to follow Jesus? There's weeks in there where you talk about the the things that are holding you back, overcoming strongholds. And and those of you who have been through it, you know the lingo, you know these things that I'm talking about, right? There's weeks where you engage in, in prayer. Like what does it look like to talk to God, not just as an individual, but also as a community, right? What does it look like to discover what my gifts and abilities are, how God has wired me so that I can do work for his kingdom and pursue the the plan and the purpose for my life that God has in store. And those are the things that God wants you to discover. And we believe that Rooted is a great way to discover those things. Now, I'll be honest, the first time that my wife ever came to me and said, man, we want, we, I think we should do a life group. Brian, Pastor Brian was like, uh, I don't know if I want to. Just being honest with you, because I'll, I'll be, the, the whole idea of getting in a circle with other humans that I don't quite know, and then talking about things that I feel, these are things that people struggle with. Predominantly, I admit, probably a lot of us dudes really, really struggle with that concept. But as a whole, we struggle with vulnerability and stepping in. And here's the excuses that I came with. I was like, man, I've got friends. I've kind of chosen them. I like them. I'm good with them. I don't need more. I said, uh, you know what? I don't really need a space to talk about my feelings. I'll just internally process all that stuff and I don't let that out, right? That was Brian's excuse. And then this is the one that's probably the most important one to me is like, I, I, I have time in my life and it's very limited and I want to protect my time. Anybody else have excuses that kind of sound a little similar to those. And per what Jimmy said last week, I had to burn those ships of excuses. Last week, I I got to circle up with my life group in my living room. And for those of you who are in life groups, 
Uh, I don't know if your life group looks much like mine, but it's like we cram as many human beings as we can into one room. And then we send all the other like little tiny human beings to another space in said household. And we just wait and anticipate for the time when they run up and run in and interrupt and go to the bathroom and, you know, make messes, all that kind of fun stuff. I don't know if your life group is like that. That's my life group, but I love it. And I love the people that I get to live alongside and rub shoulders with and engage in community together with. But I was asking them this on Monday. uh, What are the things that caused you apprehension or hesitancy as far as getting into a life group win or doing Rooted Win. And here's what they came up with. And I think that you would probably identify with one of these things. They said busyness. Like life is just so chaotic and things are so busy. Like I don't know if I have time for another thing. The second thing was this awkwardness. It's just kind of weird. Like we're gonna huddle up and we're gonna circle up. We're gonna read the Bible. And then you're gonna ask me to answer questions based upon what we read in the Bible. That's weird. What if I get it wrong, Right? The other thing that people were afraid of was not knowing anybody. This fear of just stepping into a a home and a circle and a living room. We're like, I I don't know any of these people. I don't know their story. I don't know why they're here. And that's really uncomfortable. These are probably all things that at one point or another, those of you who have yet to get into a group or if you're already in a group, these have been emotions and feelings and fears that have existed in your life as you have navigated those decisions and those pathways. And so I tell you that because I want you to know and understand that there are many, many people who are in rooted groups and life groups who can empathize with where you might be at today. But those people who have stepped into those groups have experienced overcoming those fears and experienced the community that God has created them for. And we believe so much so that Rooted is the pathway to getting in healthy community. And so I wanna encourage you, while we've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people go through Rooted over the last few years at FCC, there are still a lot of people who have not. And if you're newer here to FCC, maybe you haven't even heard of what we're talking about. And I want you to know that in two weeks, we're launching the next session of Rooted. So Rooted kicks off three times a year. It kicks off uh, here in the winter, just here in a couple of weeks. And then we've got a summer session and then we've got a fall session. Now, if you're like, I don't know what to do with this. I need to think about this. I'm gonna pray about this. We're actually gonna throw a QR code up on the screen. And I would love it if you have not done Rooted to go ahead and take out your phone. And I'm not gonna ask you to sign up right now. Like you are not committing. But what I'm going to ask you to do is this. I want you to take out your phone. I want you to scan that QR code. I want you to go to the link that that QR code is going to open up. And then I want you to commit over the next couple of days to pray and ask God if this is something that he's calling you to step into in this next season because we believe that God changes lives through community. And we believe that Rooted is transformational for the people that are able to experience it. And there's so many stories of people's lives who've been changed because they took a chance and they stepped into a Rooted group to discover what it is that God had in store for them. And my favorite stories are the ones where people go, ah, you know what, I don't think I need Rooted. I've been a Christian for a really long time. I don't need to do Rooted. I'm already Rooted, right? And they go ahead and they do it. And then they realize, oh my gosh, that that was powerful. To be in community with other people, pursuing what it means to be a disciple, to be a part of sharing stories and praying for one another has led to so much life change. And so if you haven't done Rooted, Would you consider stepping into this next session and exploring what it is that God is calling you into, what God is inviting you into? Now, maybe you've done Rooted before. I've done Rooted three times now. And I love it. And there's been multiple reasons why I've done it a couple times. One was as a staff member, just to kind of figure it out and we're test piloting it. And then I was part of one of the very first life groups that, that went through Rooted together. And the intention was, was for us, the, the intention all the time is if you do Rooted together, the intention is for the Rooted group then to give birth to a life group that continues to meet and gather after that initial 10 weeks is up. But so we did that as a rooted group and we gave birth to a life group, but uh, for reasons unbeknownst to us that we would encounter, like people moved away. People's lives got crazy. Some people started popping out babies and that disrupts all kinds of things, right? And so all of a sudden we were in a situation where we did rooted with this group of people and now the life group that we thought was going to exist because of it didn't exist anymore. And you might find yourself in a similar situation. 
You might be thinking, man, I did that rooted thing, but the life group thing just didn't happen afterwards. And, and so we wanna encourage you to take up the opportunity to get into a life group. And so we got a QR code up here that if you've already done rooted, and if you're ready and willing to get into a life group, you need another life group, or maybe it's this, maybe you really just don't have the space or the time to commit to 10 back to back to back weeks starting in two weeks. Maybe you don't have that space. Although we want to encourage you to try to find that space and burn those ships of excuses. If you want to get into a life group, man, scan that QR code. Fill out that questionnaire. Let us come alongside of you and help you get plugged in to a community that's going to help you pursue Jesus and honor Jesus and have a place where you're able to rub shoulders with other people to be more and more like Jesus. Well, maybe you're already doing it. Maybe you've done the rooted thing. Maybe you're in a life group. What's next for you? Let me challenge you with a couple of things. First and foremost, I'd ask you to consider how could you lean in even more? What would it look like to open up a little bit more, to share a little bit more, to engage a little bit more in your life group? To maybe start working through overcoming some of those fears and, and having conversations and, and ushering in these relationships of accountability that take place because of the relationships that exist in your life group. Maybe there's somebody that you're connected to that needs invited into your life group. Now check with your life group first, right? Like make sure your group is cool with you inviting other people into that circle, right? Like I don't know how max capacity works in your place. We're shoulder to shoulder. My kids, like they all fill the basement. It's craziness. But if your life group is willing to receive new people, there's so many people who need to be in community. And one of the things that we hear all the time is that personal invite can be a game changer for people to get into community. Maybe you're good, maybe you're in a life group, maybe your next thing is to consider being the person that leads a rooted group or leads a life group. And there can be some pain to overcome in that, right? Because what, what that says is like, I'm leaving my current community and my current circle in order to create a circle for other people at. And there can be some fear and trepidation in that. But guys, when we step out in faith to create spaces for other people to grow in their relationship with Jesus, God honors that. And there are so many people who need community and it might require some of us stepping outside of our comfort zones in order to create those spaces and those opportunities for other people. Now, one of the, one of the coolest things that I've seen transpire in recent history is what happened on Monday night football a couple weeks ago. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the Bengals were playing the Bills and this player, Damar Hamlin, goes down on the field and moments later you can see paramedics doing CPR on him in the middle of the field. And all of a sudden you saw grown men who are known for being tough, right? These pro athletes all of a sudden like kneeling and praying, some of them weeping in fear. And in the coming days, in the coming weeks, something really interesting transpired throughout not just the NFL, but our country as a whole. We saw guys like Dan Orlovsky, ESPN analyst, who went on live broadcast and in the middle of broadcast goes, I don't know if I'm supposed to do this. I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I'm gonna stop what I'm doing and we're just gonna pray. And on live ESPN broadcast, Dan Orlovsky and his co-host folded their hands, bowed their heads and prayed to Jesus for the football league, for DeMar Hamlin, for his family, and for all of that. The following week, as we saw teams come together to start playing football again, we saw pre-game prayer huddles where both sides of both teams were collectively all coming together and huddling in the middle of the field and taking a knee of solidarity and praying for their friend. The days and the weeks that transpired afterwards revealed something crazy special in our country and in the league. A couple of years ago, uh, we had one of my friends here, Lamoris Crawford. He was a Bengals chaplain uh, in the NFL for like a decade. And I love Lamoris. But he and I were having this conversation a couple of years ago um, when he was actually visiting. And I said, and he, he said this, he's like, man, the biggest unknown thing or unknown trait in the NFL and the league is this prevalence of faith and specifically this prevalence of Christianity. And I said, really, tell me more about that because I love Jesus and I love football. I wanna know more. And he goes, no, seriously, like every week we do pregame chapels and we have over, of the, over half of the Bengals players attend Saturday night chapels before the games. 
And then he continued unpacking. He's like, some teams see 60 to 80%. He goes, I lead a Tuesday night Bible study in my apartment and I've got anywhere from 20 to 30 athletes and their spouses who pile in like sardines into my apartment to open God's word and to pray together. And these are things, these are stories that you just never hear of. And I asked, I was like, what is it? Why is there that, that, that faith, that prevalence of faith that's cultivated amongst the league, because it's something we don't hear about. People don't talk about it. And he goes, well, think about the things that they go through. Like as a viewer or a fan of the NFL, I'm just watching what happens on Sundays. But these guys are dealing with being away from their family members for long seasons at a time. They're dealing with injuries. They're dealing with being beat out for their spots, going, getting sent down to practice squads or getting cut altogether. Like these guys are enduring injuries and there's such unity that they form because of the bond that they share, because of the experiences that they share as they navigate that season together. And I got to thinking, I'm like, man, isn't that a picture of what the church should be like? That as we experience hardship, as we experience opposition, as we experience things together, it should bond us and grow us in deeper unity than any of us can even imagine. And in my mind, I couldn't help but think about that and think, man, I wonder if the NFL is almost doing that better than the church sometimes. What would it look like if the body of Christ was so bonded and so unified and, and leaned so heavily on one another that, that we could per, be pursuing Jesus with everything that we have and everything as collective and as an individual was honoring Jesus because we were living in this community-based environment, pursuing Jesus together. You know, I also asked my life group the other day, what have been some of the greatest benefits that you've experienced because of being in a rooted group or being in a life group. And this is what they said. They said friendships, like having real authentic friendships where people can see past my junk and still love me and still care about me. They said, it makes going to church so much easier. One, I love this. One of the guys in my life group said, it can be so weird coming into a church that's as big as ours and you can walk in and not know anybody and that can be really unnerving. Now I know people is what he said that when I walk through these doors, it's not unfamiliar. It's not uncomfortable because I see people that I not only know, but I'm walking life with. We talked about how valuable it's been to open the word of God and to dive in spiritually and to ask tough questions and to lean in to what it is that God wants to teach. And they said, this was the most important thing, the prayer support. To know that when I'm going through something, I've got people that have my back. I've got people that I know are lifting me up in prayer. I've got people that I know support me and are there for me and are lifting me up to Jesus. There's something powerful when the body of Christ comes together to pursue Jesus. And it's a reminder that we don't have to do it alone. You do not have to do it alone. In fact, God gives us this opportunity to be the church so that we can have the fulfillment of living in that purpose together. James chapter five, verse 16, James writes this. He says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Have you ever noticed that when Jesus heals people in the New Testament, he also addresses their sin? Seriously, go read the gospel accounts of Jesus healing people, whether it's people who are blind or people who are paralyzed. Like every single time, Jesus not only addresses the issues of physical healing, but more importantly, the spiritual healing, the healing of the soul. Jesus was more concerned about that than he was of healing the body. And all of us, all of our souls need healing. And here in that passage in James, it says it starts with living in relationships, praying for one another so that we can experience the spiritual healing that God so badly wants for us. So whatever it is that's holding you back, maybe it's time to burn those ships of excuses to pursue the community that God not only wants you to, do, to be in, but has created you to experience and be in. The greatest healing that Jesus offers to us is through what he accomplished on the cross. The greatest healing that God makes available to us happens because of what Jesus did for you and for me by taking our sins onto the cross and dying in our place. As you came in today, hopefully you received 
the communion elements. If you're online worshiping with us today, hopefully you've gathered those with you. As we enter into a time of communion, I wanna challenge you with a couple of things. First and foremost, reflect and remember what it is that Jesus has done for you. Secondly, I want you to reflect and remember that what he did for you was not just for you, but for all people who choose to walk in relationship with Jesus. Thirdly, I want you to consider what it would look like to take a step to experience the relationships that God's created you to live in, whether they're life group relationships, rooted group relationships, accountability relationships, relationships that honor him and help you to fully live in the promise that he's created you for. Let me pray. God, thank you for your son, Jesus, who in his goodness and in his grace takes our place to die on the cross for our sin. And so God, we come to you this time to remember and reflect on what it is that you've done for us. God, I pray that as we reflect on the cross, as we reflect on Jesus and the grace that is there, God, I would, that we would remember that, God, you've done that and you've offered that to all people so that we may all walk in the fullness and the promise that you've created us for. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and take a moment and take those elements and take some time to reflect on.